Hi, Bhuvan. Uh, very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. It uh, gives me a great pleasure to extend you and uh, His uh, Excellency, the Ambassador of Romania, a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the Center for Banking Studies of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka for the public lecture on uh, macroeconomic performance and uh, financial system, sharing the Romanian experience. With great uh, honor, I would like to uh, welcome uh, the dignitaries uh, of the ta head table, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, the Deputy Governor, uh, Dr. Nandalar Virasinghe, the Governor of the National Bank of Romania, uh, Dr. Mugar Risaresko. Under uh, the public lecture series uh, of the Central Bank, organized by the Center for Banking Studies uh, for the benefit of the general public, Today's uh, lecture will be uh, delivered by Dr. Muga Isaresko. To give a brief uh, introduction about our resource person for today and to uh, say a few words, I would like to uh, cordially invite uh, with great honor the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. Over to you, sir. Dr. Isaresko, Your Excellency, uh, our other friends from the National Bank of uh, Romania, Deputy Governors, uh, assistant governors and other colleagues and uh, others who were attending from outside. Um, Dr. Isarescu has a quite remarkable, I would say unique record. He has been the governor of the National Bank of Romania from 1990 for 27 years, that, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and even, even for central bankers who in some countries do have some longevity, this is a remarkable record. And in the midst of those 27 years, uh, in 1999, when the country was going through a severe crisis, he was requested to take over the prime ministership. Uh, and he did so on certain firm conditions, that he would do it for one year, and that his position in the central bank should be retained for him to return, and, and w which, which is what he did. Uh, which is really, a, 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 I think, shows great wisdom <laughs> in terms of the relative merits of the two positions. Um, but uh, uh, Dr. Isarescu started his life as an academic. Uh, he got his PhD from the Academy of Economics at, in Bucharest, and then worked as a researcher in the Institute of World Economy uh, until 1990 when he became uh, the governor of the National Bank of Romania. And of course, he holds uh, several positions uh, in various multilateral organizations uh, as the representative uh, of Romania, as the governor of their central bank. There are, you've seen the theme for this afternoon, and it's particularly relevant and pertinent to have Dr. Itharescu here. In fact, when the ambassador spoke to me a little bit uh, several months ago about the Romanian experience and Dr. Isarescu's role uh, at the, very much at the heart uh, of uh, their transition, I thought there were several similarities in terms of the experience of the two countries. And having listened to uh, Dr. Isarescu this morning um, as he spoke about monetary policy uh, formulation and the challenges uh, Romania has faced, uh, there was certainly a great deal of resonance to our own situation. Uh, if you look back historically, um, Romania has transitioned from one of the most centrally planned economies in the world to one which is now a market-oriented economy with full capital account uh, liberalization, all within the space of 15 years. And I think when you listen to uh, Dr. Isarescu's narrative this afternoon, you will understand how they were able to cope with many challenges in going down that path. Now, our path has been far more mixed. Our record has been far more mixed. We started upon our liberalization uh, in 77, 78, as you all know, but we've kind of gone forward, come back, gone sideways. Um, it's been a far less orderly uh, process. But why it's going to be particularly interesting to listen to Dr. Isarescu is that 
from listening to him this morning, he has a tremendously practical and pragmatic approach to policy making. And having been really, really at the heart, at the center of policy making, during the period of rapid transition in his country, he really understands the nuts and bolts of how to manage reforms, how to manage a reform process. Uh, because the theory is all very well, but developing the consensus, developing a constituency for reform, explaining reform to first the polity and then to the people at large, these are all challenges as he has been through firsthand. And so listening to him, because all of us have probably read the theory, we understand that. But how you manage reform, how you push reform forward in a consistent and concer concerted way, as they have been able to do in Romania, from a very low base uh, to begin with, because President Ceausescu's time was a pretty harsh time for Romania, but they've been able to recover. They are attracting about 6% of GDP as FDI every year. They've got reserves of 40 billion, which is uh, six months import cover. So these are fundamentals they've been able to achieve through their reform process. So it's going to be very interesting to listen to you, Dr. Therescu. Please. Mr. Governor, uh, Deputy Governor, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> First of all, I, I have to thank you very much uh, to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka to the governor, to the management for the invitation to be here to address you and to have the opportunity to visit in a short period of time, but anyway, to visit your beautiful country. And I like uh, from also from the very beginning to thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Garron, for your warm hospitality uh, and uh, to invite you in public you, Deputy Governor, executives, to come also in Romania and to pay a visit to uh, my country and to the National Bank of Romania, the Central Bank of Romania. Uh, I heard that the floods uh, in the recent uh, days had some victims, and I like to express our deep condolences uh, for the victims and uh, to convey to you our solidarity. Now regarding the, my presentation, let me make uh, two remarks. First of all, that in the morning I was focused on the monetary policy, and we discussed um, different aspects of monetary policy in Romania, and I was focused also on the inflation targeting because I heard that it's an intention to move towards uh, what you define a flexible inflation targeting here in Sri Lanka. And I said that we call, uh, not flexible, we call a light inflation targeting, but it's more or less the same. Now, the presentation is a little bit different. It is on general macroeconomic performance in a financial system. And uh, as you see in the title, sharing Romanian experience. And uh, the second remark is that I have a message I'm going to tell you from the very beginning for this presentation, is that when the imbalance is built up, accumulated, uh, there is no other option but in a form or another to adjust, which any adjustment is painful. Generally speaking, from uh, our experience, when uh, the adjustment is postponed, became more painful. But how to adjust depends on the local circumstances. Then please uh, believe that when I put here sharing Romanian experiences, not to promote our way of adjustment, but only to present. And for you to take what you consider to be uh, to say significant for your experience. And then, at the beginning, a uh, content of my presentation, I will say a few words about Romania, just to know something about my country, to tell you how in Romania, that I'm not going back to my 
very beginning when I started like a governor 27 years ago. You are right, Mr. Governor, that I was graying in our institution, and uh, you said that this is remarkable. Generally, graying is remarkable, I could say. But uh, I took the starting point not uh, when we started uh, the reform in 27 years ago, but quite before joining the European Union, 2005-2006. Uh, and when it was because also a kind of euphoria, it was accumulated imbalances. And after this, I will say some words about how we did with our adjustment process, which was from the very beginning. I will repeat myself. Uh, it was painful. I couldn't recommend do exactly this. That is a purely political decision, the central bank is necessary to be involved because it's part of this adjustment, but the local circumstances are very, very important. And it's only, when I said correcting macroeconomic balance in Romania is only to present to you again, it's not to promote our way of adjustment. It will be your way of... Uh, after this, I'm going to tell you that the present macroeconomic standing is pretty good that it was put with this adjustment the basis for uh, e sustainable economic growth, but also now we are facing challenges. That my message here is an, uh, another clear message. Don't believe that uh, once you did the adjustment, you are not facing another ch challenges. The challenges could appear all the time and you have to manage, you have to keep solid hands on managing the economy because quite, if the situation inside the country is good, external shocks, sometimes uh, difficult to predict, could appear and have, you have to manage. You have to be like a pilot to manage all the time. The automatic pilot uh, in the central banking generally is not at all easy to be done. Uh, quite in a country like Romania where we are in the European Union, and we have a kind of uh, automatic uh, pilot uh, because uh, we are in a union. But we, we have to manage. This is a good message which I could promote. Uh, after this, I will say some words about monetary policy and banking sector just because it was there. But anyway, and uh, I will put also some conclusions. Now, about the country, a country with a population like uh, here around 20 million inhabitants. The surface is larger, it's five times larger than here. Uh, we are part of member of European Union. Now there are 10 years since we are joined the European Union. And as it was said, this is uh, the difference, a major difference with your country, but it was compulsory joining the European Union. It's totally full convertibility of the currency. We liberalize totally the capital account. The three freedoms are compulsory in the European Union. Freedom of labor force, movement of labor force, freedom of movement of goods and services, and freedom of movement of capital. The, at the PPP, the GDP per capita is around 22 thousands uh, US dollars. In the current prices is something like half, meaning in the GDP per capita current prices. What was before? Before, and particularly after, it was clear that Romania will join the European Union, and it was clear that we are going uh, within NATO. We've got a kind of umbrella of security from NATO uh, adherence. Uh, it was a flood, a flood of capital inflows in Romania. And based on this, this created also a kind of euphoria. Uh, for policy maker, generally, when the euphoria developed, it's good to be like a warning element because uh, euphoria could create imbalances. That's, that's the general rule in, in the life. We had a very rapid economic growth. The average was more than 6% for 2001-2008 period before the crisis. We had, before the crisis in 2007, 8% economic growth was pretty rapid. 
uh, a boom in the credit, for example. We had one year with 80, one, 80, percent growth rate of uh, uh, the credit. And particularly because of capital inflows and because of this euphoria, we are now part of European Union uh, with a forex credit, which was like a trap. Because the perception is that we are in a virtual circle, and actually the forex credit developed to be a vicious circle, creating problems, appreciating currency. And we discovered those days, I said in the morning, that the drought is simple comparatively with the flood, referring to the capital inflows. That is much simpler to deal with the drought than with short capital inflows than to deal with the flood, with the large capital inflows, because there are this euphoria. And based on this, on the reality that there are a lot of money in Romania with the capital inflows, the fiscal policy became totally pro-cyclical. It was impossible to convince the government that, to, that this is another danger, a pro-cyclical fiscal policy. They discovered they have a lot of money, and they started to to spend money and uh, to develop also a larger uh, budget deficit. Visibly, it was only 3%, but looking to the uh, structural fiscal deficit, actually we had 8% because it was an overheating economy. The economy was growing much, much more rapidly than the potential. And you know that this is like a hidden deficit and uh, appear at the surface only when the crisis erupted. And we discovered that there are 9% fiscal deficit when the crisis erupted. Before, nobody believed that this is the truth. We uh, had also external disequilibrium. It was also the mood of the period. I story also to the, our colleagues in the central bank how it was the mood that I discussed with the president of a large American bank, and he asked me, what are you doing your, here, governor? I said, I, in 2007, I, I prepared the country for not to have a hard landing because we have 14% one for external deficit. And uh, what you what we are doing, I said, I prepare for soft landing, not to have a hard landing. Why to land, he asked me. Did you hear about continuous flying? And this was the mood during before the crisis that he said, there are a lot of money in our world. You have only to discuss with us. Actually, he came from Greece those days. Uh, only to discuss with us and we have to finance. We have the possibility to finance your fly forever, which proved to be a, a real trap, but that was the mood. Now we have forgotten that. Uh, before the crisis, that was the mood. And uh, we didn't enter into the hard landing. We didn't destroy the economy. We didn't crash the economy. But it was not at all soft. It was somewhere in, in between. Then that was the situation before the crisis. And then we had the power, including a kind of political consensus, to make the, the adjustment. We were not to be candid with you, clear how painful it is. But the political decision was taken, make the adjustment. And it was, the first objective was to achieve a fiscal consolidation. The second was to reduce the current account deficit to sustainable levels. The third was to continue the process of disinflation because with the overheating economy, the inflation was much higher. And the fourth was because there were also hidden uh, non-performing loans to clean up the balance sheets amid ongoing deleveraging and to return on this basis on the sustainable economic growth. Everything was looking pretty nice when we started. When we moved on, we discovered that it's difficult to keep under control an adjustment only with the uh, market tools. That's quid. For example, we said this uh, adjustment the fiscal to take several years. Actually, it was contracted and done in only four years. Too, too much, too much. I will show you to this. 
Now, how we worked, it was a sharp fiscal consolidation. We moved in only four years into the comfort zone, and uh, it was one of the sharpest. In, I couldn't say it was unnecessary, but it was pretty sharp. And we, we, it was an increase in VAT, a reduction in the public uh, wage bill, very important, this was the most painful. And a substitution, we had to substitute, but we had also the possibility to substitute the domestically financed investment with the EU uh, funded capital. As that was an important element, which is not here. Look here. It was the second major fiscal adjustment in Europe after Greece. Some of you could tell me it was unnecessary. It was a little bit too much. And uh, if you look to the second, the gross public debt is one of the lowest in Europe. Then, in theory, afterwards, somebody could say uh, it was necessary to be done in a more slowly pace, not such a rapid pace. But this is theory. When you start an adjustment, it's difficult to keep under control, as there are a lot of other factors. And you know, try to have, uh, uh, to say, assessment is not simple to make them. The current account adjustment that it was from 13%, uh, 13%, 14 percent to less than 1%. Percent. Major major run that it was why here we did not keep under control the process it was because we had the government adjustment in the meantime the foreign banks in Romania foreign capital banks adjusted also and we tried to keep control on this process deleveraging difficult to be done and here how the crisis worked not only in Romania, but in Romania, perhaps more than in other countries. It's also a problem of credibility. That it was a kind of sudden stop in capital flows in 2009, and uh, we had two waves of adjustment. The first one was from 14, 11, 12 percent to around 5 percent. We consider this was enough and necessary. But a second adjustment process appeared in 2012, 2013. It was a second adjustment, and this was a kind of positive one. It was based on the structural reforms which appeared with the adjustment process. And it was well financed because we had European money. Here is another graph which will be important for you if you are interested. How the adjustment process, uh, the episode work. I could say, and this is the title, that the first episode was a cyclical, one with a reduction in production. The second episode was very interesting. The economy started to grow, to grow up, and uh, took speed. And at the same time, appear an adjustment because of more rapid growth of the exports. If somebody could take the second episode like a lesson, this is good. That's if the economy. Uh, has also the power to make the structural reforms, and the, there are incentives for making structural reforms. You could have both economic growth and the adjustment, and this is the best way to move. Now, from now on, I will present to you very rapidly where we stand now and uh, what uh, uh, are the challenges we are facing. The first, we kept in a way the adjustment, but because perhaps, I said, perhaps it was too rapid one, a kind of reversal of uh, fiscal and external balances appeared. That it was something like this. We moved from 40% to 1% uh, external adjustment, and after this, return to 2-3%. Is good, is bad. Here we have to, to keep in mind that the control of an adjustment is not a simple process. On the fiscal, we move from 9% in 2009 to 1% fiscal adjustment, and after this, return to 3%. Here, it's very important to see that uh, the reversal of the fiscal adjustment is perceived badly from external part, particularly from European Union, 
because they prefer to have like in France, you know, from 6% gradually to move to 3%. Now we've got a warning from the European Union because we move back from 1% to 3%. <laughs> Fiscal policy, unfortunately, remain a problem that is not simple for any government and I'm not, uh, uh, I was in the government, I was prime minister for one year. And I fully, I understand the independence of a central bank like a continuous di dialogue with the government, not like a lack of dialogue and the isolation of the central bank somewhere into the ivory tower. That's to keep the dialogue. That totally understand the way of judging of the politicians, particularly because I was there. Uh, to explain to them how dangerous is a, a pro-cyclical fiscal policy is not at all simple. I don't know how it's here, and it's good that you did not explain to me. I'm not curious if uh, you have any problem. But generally, we remain in a kind of pro-cyclical stance. Look to this graph. When the economy was growing rapidly, we stimulated the economy the fiscal policy, and when the economy started to uh, decline, it was a sharp correction. Of, uh, now the economy is moving again up, and the fiscal policy became also stimulating. Then we had, with the monetary policy, we had to be counter-cyclical, but it's not the same. The policy mix between fiscal policy and monetary policy saying in a simple way, if the fiscal policy is pro-cyclical, Let's make the monetary policy anti-cyclical to say uh, is not the optimal way. It's not the optimal. That is not the best way to try with the monetary. It's the only solution is true, but it's not the best way to try with the monetary policy and to correct a pro-cyclical fiscal uh, policy. The public debt, here you could uh, learn something. Look how rapidly a very low public debt could be more than doubled by the crisis and by the hidden deficits. We had a public debt of 12%. Nobody believed there are hidden fiscal deficits in a, in a structural form. And when the crisis erupted in less than four years, it was jumped from 13, 14% to 37%. It was leveled off, started to decline in a way, but now it's again a problem with the, with the government because they have the pressure. They have elections, they have pressures for increasing wages, they have pressures for education. Generally, we call these populist policies, but they are policies. And depending on the circumstances, depending how the government could deal with the uh, realities of any country. Another problem, we had a trade deficit, despite the fact, despite the fact that Romania had a strong industry, but gradually with the transition, it was almost disappearing, entering into the European Union. And then we remain with a trade deficit, and we had a surplus in services, but gradually, gradually we discovered that the surplus in, in uh, uh, services were not enough to counterbalance the deficit into the uh, trade area. Uh, we are still, to say, in a comfortable way with a current account deficit of less than 3%. It's not large. But the trend is not positive. That this country, in a form or another, is necessary to stimulate investment to level off the consumption and to, if not to reduce, to contain the trade deficit. And look to this. Where is the explanation that the exchange rate is stable? Because it was a question here. That's governor, what you did? We did this. That we had a current account deficit and non-debt flows in the form of FDIs, foreign direct investments and the uh, EU capital transfers, we have this chance to get some donations from the European Union, were larger than the current account deficit. Then, something like this, I will put in rough figures. The current account deficit was 1%, 2%, 3% in the last 
three years, not large, but enough to create progress on the forex market. But on the other part, capital inflows, stable, autonomous capital inflows in the form of uh, non-debt uh, flows, meaning that uh, FDIs and the EU capital transfers were two plus two, four percent. Then it was larger than uh, the current account deficit. What is the meaning of this? A totally liquid, fluent uh, forex market with a full convertibility plus a surplus which was working in a way for appreciating currency, but it was the case and opportunity for the National Bank of Romania to buy forex and to increase reserves. Look here, reserves decline a little bit and after this increase again, the total external debt more or less kept under the control and reserve adequacy, meaning all the indicators of the reserves pretty in a pretty good position. Governor, as the question was in the morning, this is a miracle. Actually, it's not a miracle. You still have a well-financed current account deficit, if it is a deficit. Gross performance. The gross performance was something like this. In the first two years when the recovery appeared, it was a low growth rate, but export-led. In my view, like a, a to say policy maker in the central bank is true. This is the solid, sol sustainable way to move. But it was not politically sustainable. All the governments after 2012, 2013, looked to stimulate, not to stimulate consumption, but to increase wages, to give more to, to the consumption, not to the investment, because there were elections, because there are demands from the public. They said, okay, it was a lot of pain during the adjustment to something also for the population. And they did. And subsequently, the economic growth was higher, which was looking pretty well, but based on consumption, meaning external deficit, which was larger, and uh, fiscal deficit, which was larger. A problem, a new challenge. Is here exactly what I said. Economic growth speeding up, no? And on the on the other part, on the right side, uh, recovering uh, the all the GDP loss during the crisis, a rapid increase in the GDP. And now look to this: with consumption replacing net exports as the main driver of growth against the background of loose fiscal income policies, we started to have larger fiscal and external deficits. A new challenge. How to deal with them? We are going to see into the future. Services have become the most dynamic sector of the economy and related to the trade, as I discussed about the trade between Sri Lanka and Romania, now our main export the uh, item is uh, that uh, the auto. The Romania became one of the main producer of auto in Europe after Slovakia, with two major companies or two major brands, Renault, Dacia, the Duster, and uh, Ford. Regarding the price stability, another challenge, a new challenge, the inflation was pretty, pretty low. In Romania it was show this. There were so many external shocks that despite the fact that we are uh, inflation targeter, we never, but never met exactly the target. And then we, this is supposed to lose credibility because it was first of all increases the VAT and indirect taxes after this was a reduction. We started with a, f to say, drought and with the increase in the price of uh, food. And after this in Europe, it was a affluence of the Food, it was the embargo on the Russia, a lot of exports of uh, food products from Europe, which were supposed to be in Russia, uh, invaded the local markets and the price of food decreased. Then from inflation targeting point of view, it's like a perfect storm. But this time not inflationary, it's deflationary. And we enter with total surprise. Nobody had the forecast governor about this. We enter into, into 
not a deflation, a negative inflation, but the public perceived is like a deflation. And the deflation with what? With the going upward uh, economic growth, with a larger deficit, with the increase in the wages, no other indicators in, instead of the price movement were looking being deflationary. But the public perceived this like a deflationary. We had negative, actually, inflation rate. And look to this. It's impossible not to have credibility problems with such ups and downs because of external shocks of the consumer price. And what we did, we moved in the public and saying the trend is important. And, and actually the trend was that the inflation moved from 8% to around zero. And we try to keep under around zero. If you look to the right uh, wing graph, you'll see that all the factors influencing prices were external to the, to the policy of the National Bank of Romania. Then an advice for the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, if you are going to inflation targeting, be sure that you could control with the interest rate movement uh, to say total complex index of consumer prices. If you have, for example, like in Romania, when we started, 40% food into your CPI, it's important to know if moving the interest rate could influence in any way the price of food. If price of food is not determined by the weather, by external factors, or how it was the case of Romania. These are the global deflationary shocks. Another important lesson from our experience. The relationship, the Philip curve between core inflation and out of gap were moving down, became, became much weak. It was a weakening relationship between core inflation and output gap in the last years, and largely due to the higher relative importance of external factors. You'll see how it was 10 years ago, the, the curve showing up, and how it is now. That, I said a lot about counter-cyclical monetary policy, is not, again, the optimal mix of policies. When you have pro-cyclical uh, fiscal policy, if you like to have counter-cyclical monetary policy, is not the best way, but we had to try to compensate the pro-cyclical fiscal policy. This is a, not the last, but anyway, one of the last, uh, the, that's a lessons I like to send to you with all the instruments. In an emerging economy, if you try to use only interest rate to keep price under control and to deal with all the problems we are facing with, uh, you are more or less in failure. More or less in, in failure. That uh, is not only Timbergen principle that you have to work with many instruments. It's also the fact, I don't know how it's here, but in uh, Romania, the central bank could be the escape goat for everything that we had to work not only with the price stability. This before becoming like a secondary target for central banking, we work with financial stability. We work with the financial stability to keep a solid banking system. And we work also the exchange rate stability. Because the first perception in the country which is opening all the borders was the exchange rate. I tried to explain one day uh, about this, uh, uh, to say, dilemma for central banking. Say, we have to look, I said, told with the, with the, the shiny word, I, we have to look at the movement of exchange rate. And uh, the other said, yes, you are right, because in, uh, entering into your office and looking to the screen, governor, where are you looking first? To the interest rate or to the exchange rate? And I confess, I look firstly to the exchange rate. <laughs> That's, that's, you know, we have to keep also external stability, despite the fact that we are inflation target. Look, we used forcefully, forcefully, we used the uh, reserve requirements, like a way of a, uh, sterilization of the excess liquidity. And it worked. That we started with a 
high interest rate on the money market, on the credit and on deposits, and we end it now with a competitive local currency credit comparative with the Forex. It worked in a totally, in a totally fully liberalized capital uh, movement country. In only 15 years, just believe that we started from the most centralized, as governor said, from the most centralized system to a full convertibility. There is no restriction in Romania regarding the forex market. And it worked. By we use more instruments, not only the policy rate of the National Bank of Romania. We are supposed to fail only with the policy rate. Uh, it worked also here. If you have the peak of the forex credit, which was almost 70% of the total credit, started to decrease gradually with the normalization of the forex market and the, and the decreasing the more liquid, more available local currency credit. And how was the movement of the uh, local currency uh, credit? That we have now the ratio is from 70 to 30. The ratio now is 40 forex to 60 local currency. And the trend is going towards uh, uh, 30 to 70. That's predominance of the local currency credit without the restrictions. We did not introduce, except the reserve requirements, which we have seen were high, we did not introduce any restriction to the forex credit. It was prohibited by the European Union, but at the same time, to say, look, the forex credit is risky, and to be compulsory to have on local currency credit, what about exports? And exporters, if you are imposing to export uh, only local currency, you are inducing to him the forest risk. Then you have to be also flexible here. I like your word, <laughs> to be flexible. On the banking sector, uh, we, after massive surge in lending uh, before the crisis, uh, particularly in the form of the forest credit, uh, we had a start and stop, but we kept the solvency and liquidity ratio of the banking sector, and we work in such a way that no penny from the public money were put into the banking sector. This was very important for credibility. Right? The banking sector in Romania passed the crisis without uh, any penny, any subsidy from the public money from the budget. And where we were necessary to uh, deal with the so-called sudden stop of the crediting you know, when the crisis erupted, we moved to the bank, to the mother banks in Vienna, and discussed with them. We had a kind of deal. It's true under the umbrella of European Commission and IMF. We had a kind of deal because just consider this: it was a very sharp reduction in government spending kind of deleveraging of, uh, to say, government spending with the fiscal adjustment, and to have in a certain time a very rapid deleveraging of the private sector, it was to kill the economy. And this, we discussed with them, it's also in your interest to have a deal and to have an orderly deleveraging. We understood that we are going to deleverage, do it in an orderly way. And this is what we did. And after this, we started to clean up the balance sheet, which is an unfolding process. And uh, the non-performing loans were fully provisioned. And after this, it was right off, starting in 2014. And the non-performing loans, which read almost 24% quite after the crisis, now is in a single digit area. And here is how this was happening. All the indicators were improved. Solvency was improved. Loan to deposits improved. Now, the main source of uh, liquidity and funding for the Romanian banks were only locally. Liquidity indicators, we have uh, actually excess of liquidity and a stable exchange rate. All the indicators were reached. And look to this. From 22, 24% non-performing loans, 
were less than 9% and going down to around 6%, which is below the European average. That is also performance, by the way of conclusion. Let me end with this. Then generally, you have to persuade the public, the politicians, and generally the country that is good to obey a rule, to avoid pro-cyclical policies. It's simple in saying, it's very difficult in understanding. To avoid pro-cyclical policies, particular fiscal policy, something like this. You have money, you have money, but stop. Don't consume all the money. Make a buffer. Just uh, understand how difficult it is politically. Uh, this is a role of the central bank. Uh, uh, that it was definition of a chairman of a central bank of America, of the Fed. He said, the role of the central bank is to take the, <laughs> the can with the punch with the <laughs> with alcohol when the uh, part is uh, overheating. That uh, is dangerous, is risky, but this is the role of the central bank all the time, all the time, to tell to the soci to society how important it is to build policy buffer in the, the boom phase, then when the economy is growing. And if you are not doing this, this is a high cost. It's meaning inability to stimulate the economy exactly when it's necessary, when the recession started. Then if you are not obeying this strict rule, which is sounding simple, but it's difficult to put in practice, we are going to have more severe recessions and painful corrections. Another conclusion. Monetary policy is necessary to be countercyclically. Theoretically, it said that the best monetary policy is neutral, but with one condition, if the fiscal policy is countercyclical. If the fiscal policy is not countercyclical, you have to accept this, again, risky role to be the bad guy in the society and to tell to the society, depending on you, governor, to say, uh, the fiscal policy is not good or so on. That I never said this. I said that is risky. In the public, I said it's very risky. I kept all the period since I was in the, my position, good relationship with the finance minister. I never enter into an open conflict because the public will not understand. The, the, you have to enter into a public conflict with the minister of finance, the public say, where is, who is right? And uh, this is not the way to solve that. It's only to create confusion and upset the society. But to say what is right, and particularly that you have to make a counter-cyclical monetary policy is necessary. And to remain like a bad guy. We are so much criticized in the Romanian society all the time, all the time. But we kept credibility. It's incredible that we kept credibility that telling the, to the society the truth. You have to be counter-cyclical. Otherwise, the, the cost will be more painful. On the financial sector, on the banking sector, prudence uh, is very important. Prudence is very important. We passed the banking crisis. Nothing is worse than a banking crisis. I lived during a banking crisis could be a disaster, that a banking crisis, a financial crisis is necessary to be avoided by all the means. And for this, it's necessary to, to, have, to be prudent. And uh, generally, to be sure that public money now not going to the banks. Banks and bankers are not very beloved. We have to accept this. I understand that there are a lot of bankers here. This is our fate. Yeah, when we are everywhere, in particular now in Europe, we are not very beloved. But we have to be respected for our job and particularly for our intermediation. And for this, it's necessary not to go to public money and to uh, move to the public money. That's, uh, because if this is the situation, the hate could become much more furious. 
And uh, like I could say, conclusion from uh, our experience is that we managed to reestablish microeconomic equilibrium. We did not uh, succeed in convincing the public totally uh, about the counter-cyclical fiscal policy. It's a lack of patience in any society. Nobody could accept that my wage will not increase. Uh, quite when we had deflation, negative price movement, the public was not accepting not to increase wages. There are a lot of reasons uh, to increase wages. Comparison with the European Union, going, for example, now the main pressure in Romania for wage increases was the fact that migration of the labor force, uh, they are bringing in all the habits on the salary levels of the European Union. Uh, and then we did, to reestablish macroeconomic equilibria, we did not succeed totally to explain how important is the financial stability and to keep the macro stability. It's a continuous fight, which is sometimes there are tolls for, for this fight. And uh, the last but not the least, and is also very <laughs> important, is to avoid a repetition of uh, the past boom and bust cycle, which uh, requires a current policy mix. If in the next years, which remain up to my total retirement, I could persuade the Romanian society that no any combination in the policy mix between monetary and fiscal policy is the optimal way that you could compensate with the uh, uh, anti-cyclical monetary policy, the pro-cyclical fiscal policy. But this is not the optimal way. It's not the same. It's not the same like having a anti-cyclical, counter-cyclical fiscal policy and a neutral monetary policy. If I could persuade then, I could say, Governor, that my duty was fully fulfilled. Thank you for attendance. Sorry for being a little bit longer, and I will stop here.